questions. What APOPS is about is trying to pick some of the best presentations that we were offered as we as in the program committee were offered, uh, which are of general interest across the community. Um, so we have three presentations to uh, fit in this afternoon. We have three more tomorrow morning that we will cover. Um, so I'd like to welcome our first speaker up on the stage, Gauta Makwati, who's going to talk about risky business. There. Awesome. Thank you. Waiting for the slides to be put on into presenter mode. Let's see if this works. It does. Awesome. Um, so since we're a small audience, I had a question for you folks. How many of you uh, actually have a domain that you own or actually help manage? Just for me to get a sense of like the audience. Okay, like a fair bit of you. Like I figured it's a network operator conference. So like a lot of you folks must have. Um, domains that you manage. So you've heard a couple of great keynotes by now, and um, all of them were filled with insight, with wisdom, with experience. Uh, unfortunately for me, as I was um, doing this talk, I realized I had no wisdom. Um, what I had were stories. So that's what I'm going to do now, uh, is I'm going to talk about a story of how we spent four years in the DNS wilderness trying to tackle a problem. So um, now my clickety thing not working. Oh, okay. So a little bit about me before I start. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford University. I just finished my PhD at UC San Diego. And uh, I work in a field which we call empirical security, which is you build systems to collect a large amount of data and then use that data to build better systems or design better protocols. And my focus has been primarily on the core of the internet infrastructure. Uh, and during my PhD, I focused on DNS, but lately looking at BGP and TLS. Okay, so the problem that I wanted to talk to you about was that of attackers targeting DNS infrastructure in order to hijack domains, okay? Uh, and this is what started our journey into uh, the DNS wilderness. So this is the problem that we wanted to tackle. And specifically, um, what, I'm, what I'd like to point out is in 2014, this French aerospace company, Snecma, was targeted by attackers um, and was a victim of a domain hijack. And what I'm going to do is use this 2014 hijack as an example of how attackers actually execute this attack um, and use that as a working example of how we may detect it. Now you might be wondering why use this 2014 hijack when there are more recent ones. And part of the reason is uh, we use, I'm using this 2014 hijack is because um, it is the hijack that got a research group interested in domain hijacks more broadly, but also because we know quite a lot about this thanks to this 2017 grand jury indictment. Okay, so if you have, um, I don't usually say this about US um, law enforcement documents, but this indictment is actually a great read and I would highly encourage uh, folks to read it. If it is, there is one uh, court document you should read, maybe uh, it is this one. And so the context behind this attack was that this was part of a larger coordinated attack against aerospace companies. And this larger coordinated attack had a bunch of known tactics. So there is spear phishing, there's malware, there's doppelganger domains, and you name it. And most of these attacks 
organizations are familiar with and know how to deal with. We may not do a great job dealing with them, but at least we know of them and have a way of tackling them. But there was one attack in particular, one intrusion tactic that stood out. And that was domain hijacking, where the attackers targeted the domain registrar. So instead of attack, uh, attacking the domain uh, itself, they attack the domain registrar in order to hijack the domain. And we thought this was interesting because it essentially bypasses the uh, organization's uh, security and instead focuses on the domain registrar. So what does this attack look like in practice? Let's say you're a client trying to log into the secure portal. Uh, I think all of us have done this before. You go to your secure.stackmer.fr uh, or whatever your company's portal is, you enter your username, password, and log in. Now, in order to do that, your client first needs to resolve the domain. Um, in this case, it's secure.stackmer.fr, and this stub resolver fires this query off to the recursive resolver, and we all know what happens next. The recursive resolver goes to the root authoritative name server. The root authoritative name server refers it to the top level domain authoritative name server. And then the top level domain authoritative name server is going to refer it to the domain authoritative name servers, which is ns1 and ns2 snackma.fr. And then the domain authoritative name servers are going to uh, respond with an IP address and the recursive resolver is going to cache this IP address and respond to the client resolver with it. And then the client, uh, the browser is then going to go to this IP address and load up this web page. The user is going to enter their credentials and get into the portal. Okay. So far, so good. Now let's see what happened in 2014. In 2014, attackers were able to maliciously update DNS delegations at the top level domain authoritative name server. So what that means is instead of responding with NS1 and NS2 snackma.fr, they instead respond with attacker controlled name servers. And I want to be clear here, unlike DNS cache poisoning, which targets the DNS query protocol, in this case, the attackers targeted the DNS delegation update mechanism, which, uh, so, which basically means that the attackers targeted the registrar and the registry in order to influence the DNS delegation object mechanic, uh, DNS uh, delegations at the top level domain authoritative name server. So this is why I asked how many folks actually have a domain because most of us are familiar with uh, actually updating records with a registrar where we log into the web portal or use an API to update our DNS configuration at the registrar. But the registrar in turn has to communicate these changes to the registry so that they are reflected in the top level domain authority name server. Um, and this is done using a protocol called EPP, which I'm not going to get into, but that's basically what happens behind the scenes and attackers figured that if they attack the registrar or the registry, they can circumvent the organization defenses. Now that the attacker actually controls the domain authoritative name servers, they're able to redirect all users to an IP address of their choice and now the browser goes to this malicious IP address, loads up a malicious version of the web page. And so whatever the attackers are entering is now getting harvested. Now at this point of time, you must be thinking, well, Gautam, this was 2014. We are in 2023. Um, browsers have a lot more protections, uh, specifically TLS. So how like this attack shouldn't work in 2023 because we have TLS. And it turns out that TLS is supposed to protect against this, but does not in this specific case because of automated certificate issuance that uses domain validation. But domain validation uses DNS to authenticate ownership. And because attackers control DNS, they're able to obtain TLS certificates for the domain. And I think there is a Let's encrypt tutorial that's happening at the same time now. But basically, um, because the attackers control DNS, they're able to use one of these uh, automated uh, ACME uh, certificate authorities like Let's Encrypt. There are many of them now in order to get um, legitimate certificates, maliciously obtained, but legitimate certificates for their domain. As a result, users 
cannot really uh, distinguish between legitimate uh, infrastructure and malicious infrastructure because for both both of them they're going to see that both of them are TLS certificate and we don't really figure out whether this is the legitimate certificate or not and users have really no way of uh, knowing that the only silver lining in all of this is that all of the certificates that get issued are uh, appended to this certificate transparency logs which um, allow for auditing. And we will see how it basically plays a role in us being able to identify the hijacks. Okay, so here's what we have learned about the hijacks. We have learned that this, these that hijacks start with uh, attackers acquiring an ability to control DNS delegations. These hijacks are characterized by brief multiple updates. So instead of hijacking for an entire day, uh, attackers typically prefer to do a few hours over a period of a few days so that they don't get discovered. And because the attackers actually control the DNS infrastructure, they can bypass TLS and DNSSEC protections. Once the attacker is able to control DNS delegations, they uh, also need to set some of uh, some infrastructure to mimic the target domain. And this um, usually means that they need a maliciously obtained TLS certificate, which makes it practically indistinguishable from legitimate infrastructure. And once you have set up this infrastructure, um, you can redirect users and harvest credentials or get them to click on some uh, malware um, and, and the possibilities are endless. And, with the, and the, all of this is towards the goal of infiltrating the target organization. Okay. Now, I just wanted to uh, take a little bit of a side tour and like talk about how the attackers are learning these new tactics. And it turns out that this specific attack was adapted from a previous attack on New York Times. So the Syrian Electronic Army um, executed this attack on August of 2013 on New York Times. The attackers saw it on uh, newspapers and sent it to each other thought it was a great idea, figured out how the attack was done, and essentially executed the same attack on the same registrar three months later, and it worked. So um, this attack, uh, and uh, over time, sophisticated like nation state actors figured out this was a super effective way of getting around organizations' security because it was essentially targeting the registrars, and we saw a widespread proliferation of them in 2018, 2019. Um, I think security vendors such as Cisco Talus, CrowdStrike, all of them documented, I think, uh, uh, quite a few uh, DNS hijacking activity in this time frame. so much so that the US Department of Homeland Security issued an emergency directive in January of 2019, asking government domains to, um, to uh, for government domains to evaluate their DNS infrastructure for signs of tampering. Okay, so given how effective these hijacks are, we thought we would like to construct a methodology to retroactively identify these domain hijacks as an independent third party. And so here was our master plan. We were going to gather data. We we're going to gather all of the DNS data. We we're going to look at all of the name server changes. And then we we're going to figure out like, what the analysis needs to be, but that should be easy because like how bad could it really be? And then identify hijacks. And it turns out that that was not easy. DNS was full of mystery and we realized that not only could we not figure out what the hijacks were, but we realized we stumbled onto a new problem. And this new problem was basically this mystery name server change that we could not explain. So on one hand, we have hijacks, and this was something different. In this case, we saw an official uh, county domain, uh, in this case, White County, Georgia, in the USA. And their name servers, one of the name servers, ns2.internetemc.com, was replaced with ns2.internetemc.randomcharacters.biz. But this second domain, internet emc random characters .biz, was not registered. So it wasn't like an attacker actually replaced the name service to hijack it. It was just there, but it was a lame delegation. But an attacker could register that domain 
and be the authoritative name server for the domain. Uh, not only that, we found tens of thousands of domains that followed this, this style. So what happened here? And it turns out that this is a result of 20 years, uh, like 20 years of registrar naming practices. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but if you folks are interested, there is a paper that talks about this. And uh, there is actually an ICANN SAC working group trying to figure out what the new naming practices should be. And if you folks are interested in why that happens, I'm happy to chat with you later on. But let's go back to targeted hijacks. And so the challenges that we faced in identifying these targeted hijacks, the first was, uh, was we had a hard time delineating malicious updates from legitimate updates. So not only did legitimate updates look like malicious updates from time to time, but sometimes malicious updates look legitimate too. So for example, you'll consider this uh, domain name, uh, name server changes, which basically went from AWS name service to something under its own name service. And this looks like something a reasonable domain would do, like just bring name servers from AWS to something under its own domain. But this was a hijack, and the only way we could have ever told that this was a hijack was if we, if we looked at the IP addresses of the name servers, and even then one could be like, oh, like this could be legitimate. And so um, altogether, we realized that just using DNS was not going to be enough. And the second aspect of this was that these malicious updates were short-lived. So data sets that we would typically use to understand DNS would not really work here. And together, we had two lessons. First was we couldn't rely on DNS to determine DNS hijacks. And the second was that we needed multiple data sets to corroborate hijacks. So we went back to the drawing board. We figured out, let's focus on the operational requirements of the hijack to figure out, is there another way to identify these hijacks? So what are the operational requirements of the hijack? The first is that the DNS resolutions must be updated to this malicious IP for the duration of the hijack. The second is that the attacker must be able to acquire a new TLS certificate to prevent warnings. And then the attacker must take this new TLS certificate, use it on their web server, and then um, redirect this redirect the domain to the malicious IP, okay? And therein lies the key insight for our approach. The, the key insight here is that the attacker infrastructure is going to appear in global IP scans looking for certificates. And if it still doesn't like click, that's fine. We'll go through an example to make sure that uh, it sort of clicks. But here is the intuition behind our approach. What we're going to do is we are going to identify the attacker infrastructure we're going to identify the IP address and the malicious certificate. And once we do that, we are going to use global IP scans to identify the attacker infrastructure and the malicious certificate. And once we do that, we're going to use passive DNS to corroborate that the target domain was indeed redirected to this malicious IP. And once we know that, we can then use certificate transparency logs to corroborate that the certificate was issued during this period of redirection. And altogether, then we have some compelling hijacking evidence. We now know that the domain was not only redirected, but that a new certificate was issued during this period of redirection, and that this certificate was used at this redirected IP. Okay, we'll work through an example to make sure that it clicks through, but a lot of this is it hinges on our ability to identify attacker infrastructure. And I just waved through uh, what, how we would identify this attacker infrastructure. So let's, let's walk through how we would identify this attacker infrastructure. In order to identify attacker infrastructure, we first need to map out the observable infrastructure for the domain. The observable infrastructure for a domain are the IP addresses and certificates that secure and serve the domain. So going back to our favorite domain, uh, secure.snecma.fr, we have an IP address and a certificate A that secure and serve the domain. 
now we can add some additional annotation like the geolocation, the origin AS, the issuing certificate authority in order to get a better sense of what the observable infrastructure looks like. So now that we know what this infrastructure looks like, we can then observe it longitudinally to look for anomalies. So in our first scan, we see that there is this French IP address. There's this French IP address with certificate A, um, and that's fine. We have, uh, we, we're going to uh, look at the next week. So a week later, nothing really changes. Uh, it's still the same IP address in France with the same origin AS offering up the same certificate. But in week three, we see this new deployment show up in the US at a different IP address with, the, uh, with a different certificate issued by a different certificate authority um, originated by a different AS. But at this point of time, we don't really know if it is legitimate or malicious because it very well could be um, this French aerospace company opening shop in the US. And if this deployment were to last for a long time, as an independent third party, we cannot really tell if this, this is legitimate or malicious. But if it disappears immediately, then we know that something was suspicious here. And thankfully for us, it actually does disappear uh, relatively quickly. Uh, in a week later in our fourth scan, we don't see it, which makes us think that that was in fact suspicious. So if you were to look at it longitudinally, uh, what we are calling deployment maps, we would see that this second deployment, this transient deployment, has a very different fingerprint from our first deployment, the stable deployment. And as such, I think we're ready to call this second deployment uh, a suspicious one, and that might be potential attacker infrastructure. And so now if we check passive DNS and check CT logs to check if the domain was actually redirected and the certificate was actually issued during the period of redirection, then we can start putting together a case that this was in fact a hijack. So based on that intuition, we had this five-step uh, methodology where we went through millions of IP scans, millions of domains, um, and then we identified 41 domains as hijacked within a four-year period. And 33 of these domains um, uh, we had already looked at from news media reports and we were able to re-identify all of them and verify from news media reports, but eight of the domains that we identified uh, were not previously identified. And these are high confidence manually evaluated hijacks. So there are many, 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 many more where there is circumstantial evidence, but we just couldn't convince ourselves that um, that that these were hijacks. So one example is there are a lot of postal domains where we have no idea why somebody would want to hijack post postal domains. Like uh, Australian Post is one. Actually, Australian Post we have uh, it's from 2014. We have compelling evidence that it was hijacked, but not in the 2017 time frame. We have the the Turkmenistan postal domains being hijacked. And I have a list of them if you folks are interested about some of the more bizarre domains. Why, like, why would they be hijacked is not obvious. But here is a here is a here is a sample. Like before I show you the 41 domains, here is a sample of four domains that we discovered were hijacked that uh, were not previously reported. So here is a list of four domains uh, in the Kyrgyzstan uh, .kg uh, top level domain. Three of them are government domains. One of them is an infrastructure services provider um, and network operators actually seem to be uh, particularly targeted. All of this was in December of 2020. All of them had their mail infrastructure targeted from, uh, from the same AS geolocated to Russia. And I just want to be clear, uh, the geolocation is not denoting attribution um, because as we just discussed, all it really takes to um, execute this attack is somebody willing to lend you an IP address and that anybody could set up anywhere. So this geolocation does not denote attribution. Um, so three government domains, one inter internet services provider, in each case mail, 
Um, so give you a sense of what this attack looks like. So in one case, the attackers were harvesting credentials, but in another, we see this, um, this error pop up when you try to log in saying, oh, like to continue using this email address, like email service, please install the new security update. And there's an update uh, which essentially links you to a malware, which if you run, of course you're compromised. Here is a list of the 41 domains. I do not expect anyone to read these domains, uh, but to give you a sense of most of the domains are government and infrastructure providers. Um, and which is why uh, we thought this might be of interest to you folks because in, in, internet infrastructure providers are actually targeted quite a bit because you folks are gateways, you, you see a lot of traffic and um, attackers, specifically nation state actors find that particularly uh, attractive. So um, I'm going to quickly summarize given the time and then talk, uh, have some thoughts so that uh, it sets up some stage for discussion or potential questions. But basically what we saw in summary is that it is possible to identify these hijacks as a third party. And the key insight there was not looking at DNS to determine DNS hijacks. And more concerningly, what we found was that traditional mechanisms to protect uh, against hijacks such as TLS and DNSSEC don't really work in this particular style of hijack. And that there is a need for more transparency and proactive measurements to understand how to mitigate these hijacks. So with that summary aside, like I just wanted to share some parting thoughts and like hopefully um, seed some questions or like discussion for later on. And the first was that the, was the sense that DNS introduces this dependency on external entities, the registrar, the registry, allowing for a supply chain attack. Uh, and this is not a hypothetical risk and operators are becoming prime targets for this. The second thought was that uh, we have a tendency to always think of secure protocols um, as always secure, and that is not necessarily the case. And like my my favorite example in this case uh, is the TLS icon, like which used to be green um, when uh, it was encrypted, and users sort of thought that the green meant that this was in fact PayPal or this was in fact WhatsApp, uh, when that is not what it meant. Uh, so much so that uh, Google Chrome actually um, had to get rid of the green icon. And I guess my point here is that we should understand the limitations of TLS and DNSSEC and make sure that uh, we're designing systems uh, with the limitations of these protocols uh, in mind. And finally, uh, we need to have monitoring and transparency. And I think DNS can do a long uh, go a long way in having better transparency. Um, so for example, like right now, organizations can't really tell if their name servers have changed. For example, apricot.net, like um, unless you really check at this point of time, you don't know if the name servers have changed or not. The zone files say that they haven't changed in a few years, but how do you know? And, um, and that's why sort of having some form of transparency where um, like some certificate transparency, like transparency where all of the updates get published um, might go a long way in appeasing people off, um, might con convincing people that their DNS infrastructure has not been tampered with. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, thank all of my collaborators. And um, if you folks have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. So any questions for Gautam? We've got the mics in the middle of the room. I think people being a little bit shy, <laughs> but that will be around um, rest of the day and a little bit tomorrow morning if you would like to talk with them. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you very much. Token of oh, appreciation. Thank you. Small thing from April Club. Thank, thank you, you very much. So next up, we have Mark Tinka who will be talking about SDM. And I'll let him tell you what that is. Thank you, Mark.
Thanks, Philip. Okay. Um, hi. My name is Mark Tinker. I'm with the Southern Africa Network Operators Group. And today I'll be speaking to you about something happening in the subsea space, uh, submarine cable space, um, specifically on the advancements on um, where we're going with capacity handling, especially in light of the traffic growth, mostly by the content folk. Um, and I'll be speaking about SDM, spatial division multiplexing, which is a new approach uh, in advancing that cause. It's just a bit of history, uh, not too much. Cable systems have been around since 1866. Um, I think one of the first ones, the first ones across uh, transatlantic was uh, TAT1. Um, and as of 2023, I think we're close to 1.6, 1.7 petabytes of traffic. Um, evolution in that period also has seen us going from uh, frequency modulation in the old days, uh, then onto WDM uh, and now into SDM, which enhances WDM to expand capacity on the submarine side. Um, these two mechanisms with which uh, we've been able to transport uh, capacity over, uh, well, both terrestrial and submarine infrastructure, and they've always been either direct detection, which is the one above, and or coherent detection, which is the one below. Um, Direct detection is primarily what we used to do uh, where the most we could get out of a fiber system was maybe two and a half gig to 10 gig. Uh, and the main reason for that was uh, fibers in that time had a high degree of chromatic dispersion. Chromatic dispersion is, is what happens when different frequencies in the wavelengths travel at different speeds. So they begin to overlay and phase into each other. Uh, the way to fix that was to have uh, dispersion compensated fiber. So for every couple of lengths of fiber, you have uh, both positive and negative uh, fiber spans in that length. And that allows for that compensation. But then now with coherent technology, which adds phase as well as frequency uh, compensation in the DSP in the chip, you're then able to, to expand capacity and compensate for that uh, chromatic dispersion and take us all the way up to what we're seeing today of 800 gig of capacity per wavelength. Um, so this is where most of the technology right now is within the submarine space and also where it's heading towards within the terrestrial, metro and long haul. And then historically, this is where it's been at. So it's not a long time. We're looking at maybe 11 years within which all this has happened. So coherence has been around since around 2010. And with each successive iteration, you're looking at the CMOS or you know, the, the wafer just getting smaller and smaller. So you can reduce the amount of power required to generate the same uh, amount of capacity. So, I mean, in 2010, we were at 100 gig. And by 23, now we're at 800 gig. Um, and what you see below here is just other digital techniques in the DSP, in the coherent optic that allow you to compensate for high chromatic dispersion. That then gets you to that kind of capacity. Uh, what has happened in the last year or two is ADVA, together with a company called Coherent Corp, uh, formerly known as 2.6, which is a play on the periodic table. Um, have developed an optic for the ZR application. So long distance at 100 gig coherent. So that means that, you know, up to about 120 kilometers, you can have an, amp an, amp an, an amplified WDM uh, uh, tunable uh, channel, uh, which is ideal for the metro and fairly long distance uh, applications. Or you can have close to a thousand kilometers amplified for the same optic. Now, will we see this replacing long haul? Probably not, because super channels today run at about between 400 gig to 1.2 tera. But at least in the metro, that means you can carry, you know, uh, 100 gig of a dark fiber within the metro or between cities without having to amplify, which is quite useful. So that's router to router, router to switch. And I think this is potentially going to allow you to move away from standard DCI interconnects 
that are based on WDM transport. Uh, this is tunable. Also, it's a QSFP28 interface, which means it's, it will support less than five watts of energy at full capacity, which is fantastic. But most importantly, it's also vendor neutral. So even if it's manufactured by Adva, you can use it in any product. Okay, so this is not to plug them, but just to show you where the industry is right now, because in terms of long span ZR optics for this kind of capacity, they seem to be the only vendor right now pushing out this uh, at, at five watts. So. Um, so what are the ways that we can improve capacity handling in WDM networks? Uh, WDM networks are typically fixed grid. So you have fixed grids of 75 gigahertz, 50 gigahertz, 25 gigahertz, et cetera. Um, and while that is a bit cheaper to operate, it means that you, you waste a lot of capacity, a lot of bandwidth and you can't get the most out of the system. Uh, so with fixed, with fixed uh, grid systems, you have to squeeze uh, all your capacity within the same amount of bandwidth. That means on the outer edges, you're gonna be losing some efficiencies. You replace that with flex grid systems. With flex grids, you can take full advantage of the entire 4.8 terahertz C band capacity, and then break it up in chunks of 12 and a half gigahertz. Some operators actually breaking it up in chunks of six gigahertz as to make it even tighter. But the good news here is that you can have multiple different channels running at different bandwidths, which means you can sell different services to different customers over the same WDM transport without losing the efficiency of, of the spectrum. Uh, modern WDM systems today, both for terrestrial and submarine, are supporting uh, flexible grids. Um, because then you can get more out of the system that way. Um, who's heard of Shannon's limit? Right, okay. So for those who haven't, essentially um, it's a theory that says for a given amount of, um, for a given amount of channel bandwidth and a given amount of signal quality, uh, relative to noise, you can only get a certain amount of, of uh, capacity out of it. And this limit was theorized way before WDM. Uh, uh, so it's interesting that we're sort of starting to hit this number um, because uh, as coherent comes online and as the CMOS begins to become smaller and smaller, we start getting really close to this limit of how much capacity we can carry in a spectrum for the amount of noise we generate to do that. Um, and the way this between between Shannon's limit and Moore's law, you have with Moore's law, we are shrinking the size of the wafer. I mean, Shannon's limit, we are pushing the the power requirements to put capacity on that wafer. So at some point they are converging now. Um, and we see that SDM is the way to fix that, at least in a capacity standpoint. Um, evolution of submarine cables uh, infrastructure. Uh, the first one was uh, dispersion uh, managed fiber, which was anything prior to, say, 2010, um, um, which, you know, could only do up to two and a half to 10 gig. Um, and then next came uncompensated cables, which is from 2014 to about 20, well, from 2014 to now, actually. Uh, with uncompensated cables, we can now take full advantage of coherent um, because coherent likes to have high chromatic dispersion, which is what uncompensated fibers support. Um, the number three is a bit of a misnomer, but I had to put it here anyway. It's a festoon. So festoons tend to be links that run between cities across the coast. Uh, you know, so think uh, if you take East Africa, for example, think Mombasa, think uh, Djibouti, think Dar es Salaam, that sort of thing. Those tend to be short spans, so you don't need any amplification along those, but those aren't a real issue. SDM cables, which is 2020 onwards, is, is where we're at in the current state of the technology uh, today. And we'll get a little bit more into that. So trying to sidestep Shannon's limit um, with, uh, with submarine cables. Uh, basically, with SDM, you are effectively increasing the number of fiber pairs in the system, uh, but you're reducing the amount of capacity you carry on each individual fiber pair. So you're maximizing the capacity of the entire cable, not of each fiber pair. 
Uh, that's how SDM works. Uh, previous systems, uncompensated fibers, for example, would maximize the uh, capacity for each fiber pair in the cable system. Uh, so because of this, you're able to space out your repeaters, your amplifiers across the seabed uh, much more effectively, uh, which means you require less power, which means you can support more fiber pairs. So that's how this works. So on a per fiber basis, you are running less capacity, but on the whole, you can support 50% more fiber pairs. So that's how you gain um, the efficiency. Um, so yeah, so just to reiterate, so basically you're optimizing repeater power and spacing, um, uh, which means you need, require less power, uh, which means you suffer less um, uh, nonlinear penalties. And obviously, most importantly, where the majority of the uh, uh, benefits come from is the fact that you're sharing uh, laser pumps, because laser pumps are what draw the most amount of current off, uh, off the fiber system. Okay, so just the bottom here, lower fiber pair capacity, but you get more fibers, so you get high capacity across the board. Um, on uncompensated fiber systems, which is what predated the existing SDM, so from 2014 to about 2020, it's basically uh, you get high, you use a lot of power to drive the amplifiers, uh, which means you have to limit the number of fiber pairs you can have in the system. Um, it's all positive dispersion, so it's great for coherent technology. It can, you can use the DSP in the chip to compensate for dispersion, but you only get four to eight fiber pairs. Okay, so you can get as much as 800 gig, uh, but because you get about six or eight, maybe sometimes 10 fiber pairs, the most you can do is maybe between 32 and 192 tera, which is not bad. Okay. But then if you go to uh, SDM, now with SDM, because you have much more wider uh, amplifier spacing, it means that you don't need to run, uh, I mean, you can support many more fiber pairs within the system uh, because you know the less power you put into the system, the more fiber pairs you can support. Um, you're running low power on each fiber pair. So that means you have a lot more headroom and you don't run into nonlinear impairments as a result. That means you can have up to 24, and I think the market's looking at 32 to 40 fiber pairs now. And with each fiber pair running at about uh, anywhere from four to 24 terabit, you can do close to half a terabit, almost 600 terabits in a fiber pair, in a, in a cable system. So that's how SDM works. You have less capacity per fiber pair, but you have more fiber pairs in the system. And this is just a summary of, of how you know, they've evolved. So if you look at O3, you look at Apollo, which was a dispersion managed uh, fiber system, and you could see it only had four fiber pairs, each running at a maximum of 10 tera. And by the way, just for comparison, this is the same distance. So this is all about 6,000 kilometers, which is typical uh, transatlantic. You have Maria, Maria, which is a uh, Microsoft Meta, and uh, what's the third one? Uh, Talzion, I, Talzion, I think they're called. A combination of them three, uh, which is an uncompensated cable with eight fiber pairs with 26.2 tera per fiber pair. And then you've got Danant. So Danant was the first SDM cable uh, between Europe and North America, uh, which is the Google one. Uh, that one is 12 fiber pairs, 25.2. So you can see the Danant one has much lower capacity than the Maria one, but because it's got 12 fiber pairs, you have much more overall capacity. Uh, same for the Meta cable, which is currently in force. Uh, 24 fiber pairs, 21 tera. I think this is the um, the Meta cable must be the two Africa cable. Um, so again, just to, uh, benefits of SDM, just to reiterate, again, lower capacity for per fiber pair, but you get more capacity per cable. Um, you get lower wavelength power, so you you get lower signal to, better signal to noise ratio. Um, uh, and then also you need less power at the power feeding equipment because in submarine, in terrestrial, you tend to power the fiber pair at every amplification point. In submarine, you tend to power it from either side of the cable landing station. So, so because of that, the amount of power you can put into the system is much more uh, limited. Uh, so the less you can use, the more, uh, the longer you can run the system for. And obviously because you're using less power, 
you get more margins for improvement as the tech begins to develop. Um, outlook for cables over the next uh, three, four years is these. Um, I think one of the large ones there is Medusa, the 24 uh, fiber pair system. Medusa is uh, North Africa. There's a bit of South Europe and I think a bit of the Middle East as well. Uh, that's uh, that's a big job. I think that's 480 tera. Um, so you can see this is typically what you would expect from new SDM cables going forward. Um, but again, it's not easy. So you can imagine with a system like this, you're looking at 24 fiber pairs. Um, not every customer on the system is going to buy a fiber pair. They will buy a fraction of a fiber pair. And one wonders how you buy a fraction of a fiber pair. Now that goes into spectrum because then you're buying spectrum. Um, and then, so how do you manage spectrum? Uh, and how do you do all those things? So the administrative side of SDM is still under development. A lot of it has to do with, uh, with uh, automating with things like open RODEM and open WDM and so on and so forth, because different customers on the same fiber, even with the same wavelength can use different equipment. Uh, so that's still a bit of a challenge. Um, because there's plenty of moving parts and it looks something like this, you know, for example, right? So you've got, um, there's the infrared thing up. So you've got obviously the wet system coming into the rodem that is managed by the fiber system owner. Um, and then you've got the fiber system owner giving either uh, fiber pairs or um, spectrum to a bunch of other customers who are running their own uh, rodems and transmission systems on the system. Um, and then each of these could also farm out specifically to other customers also. So, you know, how do you test? How do you do an end-to-end -end test? How do you manage provisioning? How do you manage RFS, uh, ready for service? How do you manage uh, uh, planned events and all of that stuff? So. These are some of the complications of SDM systems because there's just simply too many permutations uh, with where cables can land, which are express routes, which are festoon routes, which are more direct, which need to hop. Um, and the administration is still what's under, well, let's just say it won't survive uh, an Excel spreadsheet. It needs something a little bit more advanced than that. So this would be the biggest concern around SDM, uh, but it's where we're going. Um, and we're not, we're not going back because it's just a significant amount of explosion capacity requirements. Um, yeah, and the future is basically anywhere from 32 to 40 fiber pairs. Um, that would be governed mainly by uh, how much we can get away with fitting a certain amount of fiber in because the the standard width of a uh, cable that goes into the sea is about 17 millimeters ish and the standard uh, width of the fiber fiber core is about 250 micron so you can only fit about 16 of them in that space if we can reduce um the fiber to about maybe 200 micron we can probably fit about 24 and if we can reduce that further by maybe you know thinning out the cladding uh, uh thinning out some of the other bits in the fiber then we can probably get maybe 30 32 in there um 17 millimeter tends to be the sweet spot uh, because the 20 millimeter which is wider is a bit heavier and more expensive for cable ships and so forth um, so that's really where the engineering is at. Um, there's other novel fiber ideas like uh, hollow core fiber or multi core fiber that uses multi mode within the fiber itself. That's very fancy. Uh, but for that to gain traction in the submarine space, it would have to gain traction in terrestrial space. And in terrestrial space, they don't have these restrictions. So, probably won't. Uh, so, I think emphasis is going to be on just how much you can fit more fibers into the 17 millimeter core of the cable that goes into the seabed. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Any questions for Mark? We seem to have a lot of bout of shyness here. Mark, surely it must be a question. Uh -huh. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Token of appreciation from Apricot. Thank you. I now have two mics. Um, so the next presentation, I'd like to invite John Brewer to come to the stage for the final presentation of the afternoon. It's all yours, John. Hello, Jonathan Brewer, and um, I've been involved with um, ISP networks since 1995 and building access networks since 2004. Um, I love building um, access networks, uh, especially wireless access networks and networks for rural and remote locations. And so it was, um, uh, they're getting my slides ready. So it was really nice when uh, about 18 months ago, the um, Asian Development Bank uh, asked me to um, work on a paper for them on last mile connectivity. Do we have the slide? Hey, we got a slide here. All right. So this uh, talk is called Last Mile Connectivity, Addressing the Affordability Frontier. It is a companion uh, slide deck to a working paper, uh, ADB's Sustainable Development Working Paper 83. There is a link to that paper on the last slide, uh, along with the disclaimer on the last slide that says, um, these are my ideas and the bank doesn't necessarily endorse or agree with any or all of them. So uh, happy to be here speaking with you today. There we go. So the last mile connects a user's device to telephony and the internet, or it connects a terminal that provides Wi-Fi for user devices. Uh, in developing Asia, the last mile is usually mobile networks. Meaningful connectivity, another topic we're going to talk about that we don't talk about in technical conferences often. It's a framework used to evaluate the quality of internet access. Uh, the concept is promoted by uh, the uh, A4AI, Association for Affordable Internet, and the Broadband Commission for Sustainable, De Sustainable Development, which is part of the UN, UNESCO. Uh, meaningful connectivity goes beyond the traditional uh, definitions of universal service, uh, oops, universal service, which is uh, having a telecommunication service to everyone and universal access, which is uh, everyone being able to afford to use the service. So affordable broadband is a key tenet of meaningful connectivity. The measure of affordability commonly used in the industry is the cost of some data relative to 2% of GNI per capita. That's the accepted metric. You want more? That's the accepted metric, and both A for AI and the Broadband Commission uh, have used this metric to set targets. Uh, back in 2016, A for AI made their target called one for two, uh, and that is one gigabyte of data per month for 2% of GNI per capita. And the UN, uh, via the Broadband Commission, um, uh, followed that in 2018. Now, both have reevaluated their targets, saying, oh, well, one gig isn't enough. And they've said, oh, A for AI has said by 2026, uh, we should all have five gigabytes a month of data for 2% of GNI per capita. And the Broadband Commission has said, well, I think uh, we, we think that 2030 is a good target for this. But um, it happens that uh, COVID-19 really showed us that one or five gigabytes a month of data is nowhere near enough for most users. Um, this chart here is what it takes in data for a Zoom call or a WebEx or a Google Meet call um, with one person or a few people, six participants or 11 participants. You know, everything went to online meetings, including Apricot and APNIC conferences. Uh, well, that's, um, could the um, technical people stop my slides from auto advancing, please? <laughs> I'll go back there, yeah, if you can just, anyway. Um, so we can use a gigabyte of data an hour uh, and that um, makes uh, one or five gigabyte a month targets uh, not good. So if one or five gigs a month is not enough, how much is? Well, uh, India was already using 10 gigabytes a month of data in like 2019 or 2020 on average. Uh, so this is mobile data consumption. Uh, India, of course, is the top of the averages. Global average there is in black. Um, this data is from Ericsson, uh, from uh, their mobile broadband reports from 2021. They are expecting by 2026 that the Asia Pacific average is going to be 40 gigs a month. So here we have 
uh, uh, the um, A for AI 2026 target of five gigs average is going to be 40. And the Broadband Commission is saying, oh, we should hit that five gigabyte target by 2030. So no, that's that's not going to work. Right. We're going to talk about the affordability frontier. The affordability frontier is this place where it's beyond the limits of universal service. It's beyond the limits of universal access. It's beyond government plans for building universal access. Uh, it's beyond commercial feasibility. Now, why is it beyond these areas? Either because of poverty or because of geographic isolation or because of both. Uh, so the affordability frontier is an access gap. It is a place where it is just not feasible to provide meaningful connectivity. How do you identify access gaps? Well, I do this for a couple of uh, government uh, uh, departments in New Zealand. I do this for a couple of regions. I use population data from uh, the census, uh, geographical data from uh, LIDAR and satellites, uh, utility information, so uh, GIS data of the um, electrical networks and the fiber networks and uh, the DSLAM cabinet coverage. Um, I build maps of the mobile coverage. Uh, from tower locations and license data, so how much power they're using, what sort of antennas and frequencies they're using. I make independent coverage maps because they're better than the mobile operator maps. And I would love to have OTT data. We know that a lot of apps on smartphones actually have location information about where people are using them. Um, we've seen this in, in instances like the Strava uh, leak of data where uh, we found military bases because people were recording their runs. Um, I would love to have data um, from OTT application operators to include in this, but I don't. So with gaps identified, um, we should be able to just choose a technology, find a good business model, uh, add some money, add some finance, and we can solve the problems of meaningful connectivity, especially if we're adding finance. Um, but there are a lot of barriers standing in the way of uh, providing meaningful connectivity at the affordability frontier. And we'll talk about those barriers now. First off, geography and population density. We've got um, two evaluations here. Um, one is inhabitants per square kilometer. In, uh, we've got Tanzania here and Indonesia. So uh, we can see that in the rural areas, the population density is far, far, far lower. And in the next um, chart here, we have monthly uh, spend per revenue generating person. So this is, uh, if you happen to be somebody who's gonna buy a mobile subscription, how much money are you spending every month? Well, in uh, urban Indonesia, you may be spending $570 a month. In rural Indonesia, you're spending less than $200 a month. So we have this dual problem of um, far fewer people in rural areas and the people in rural areas have far less money to be spending on their communications. Now, another barrier to building access networks is access to radio spectrum. We've got four types of radio spectrum that are important here. Um, ISM or open spectrum is uh, industrial, scientific, and medical spectrum. We think of it as Wi-Fi spectrum. 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, 900 megahertz. These bands that are free and open for anyone to use from their Wi-Fi terminal to their user device. Um, some people build outdoor access networks with the spectrum, um, but for the most part, we think of it as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We need microwave or fixed um, spectrum to backhaul cell sites. Um, most cell sites in this world are still backhauled with microwave. They are not even close to being backhauled by fiber yet. Um, fiber is a Western world thing when it comes to cell towers. Um, satellite spectrum. Satellite spectrum is generally used to provide service to a terminal. Um, it's used to provide tower backhaul. It's used to provide city or island backhaul. One day soon, it will be uh, used to provide backhaul directly to people's mobile devices. Um, that day isn't yet, but that day is probably sometime this year. So um, uh, we should look forward to the latest uh, Qualcomm Android devices and Apple devices having some direct uh, from satellite to device connectivity soon. So in terms of radio spectrum in um, Asian Development Bank's member countries, which mostly overlap with uh, APNIC, um, we have the um, Commonwealth of Independent States in ADB's developing member countries, uh, and they are in RIPE, I believe. Yeah. 
They're they're all in ripe, aren't they, Philip? Yeah, CIS are all right. Anyway, um, spectrum in ADB countries is generally much under allocated uh, in uh, 700 megahertz, 2.3 gigahertz, 2,500 megahertz. Um, most of the spectrum is not allocated. Regulators could increase those allocations and everybody's mobile phone can use these bands. So it would be of benefit to everyone. Access to energy. So cellular towers usually require reliable grid power. Cellular towers take kilowatts of electricity. Five kilowatts is kind of a, a small tower. Um, hard to do that on solar. Uh, if you do have grid power in a remote location, uh, it tends to be less reliable than in an urban location. Uh, when it breaks, it takes longer to get it fixed. We're seeing this all over New Zealand um, with the result of the cyclone from two weeks ago. Our most remote communities uh, still have neighborhoods without power. Our most remote cell sites still are without power uh, because it takes longer to repair. So alternative energy solutions, they can be large and costly. Here we have the amount of uh, solar panels required to power one tower, one set of antennas here, one microwave backhaul link. And uh, I'm told by a neighbor of this tower that the diesel generator here runs pretty much all the time and there are trucks coming to refill the fuel every month. So even this many solar panels is not enough to run this cell tower. So some other barriers here, uh, access to land towers and buildings um, throughout this region and throughout the world. The incumbent is usually some descendant of a state owned enterprise, such as the post office uh, or uh, the phone company. You know, the, the, the dominant carriers, they used to be the government. So they have access to the best buildings, the best hilltops, the best towers, the best access routes. Um, sometimes they don't wanna share that access. Frequently, they don't wanna share that access. Safety and security of people and property. Um, again, using New Zealand as an example, um, the biggest problem we're having in keeping remote communications up since the cyclone is generator theft. There have been a large number of generator thefts and a large amount of resources being ex expended now to keep people from stealing the generators. Um, when it comes to people, well, cellular technicians drive around in trucks with trucks full of tools uh, and they are a target for theft. Batteries in cell sites are a target for theft. Solar panels are a target for theft. As you get into more remote areas, you have no police presence. You have no way of uh, uh, protecting yourself against this theft. So it just makes it much harder. Another barrier out there is operator licensing. Um, in most uh, markets in uh, the APNIC community, um, governments restrict the building of infrastructure to only a few companies. Most countries here, there are only three or four or five operators who are actually allowed to build their own fiber optic cables uh, and cellular towers. Uh, and the rest of them who do go and build their own fiber um, aren't actually doing it with legal permission. Finally, access to finance. Um, as we saw in the slide comparing Indonesia and Tanzania, um, your customers in a rural area are poor. There are far fewer of them. Um, you don't have the money to uh, to make a good return on those customers. So your finance is going to be very difficult. Your lenders are going to look at the business proposition of building a new cellular tower in a remote area. And they're going to say, don't do that. That's not good for your business. Right. With those barriers taken away, let's talk about technologies, which is more... Um, this sort of conference. Um, fiber and wireless technologies are the ones that are important for um, our community and for Asian development banks, uh, developing member countries. Um, GPON, Gigabit Passive Optical Network. GPON is a great technology, both for fixed access and for mobile backhaul, for tower backhaul. Um, we're just starting to see a bit of GPON in uh, the four and eight gigabit per second variants used for mobile tower backhaul in New Zealand. Um, there are also wireless technologies that can uh, be used to address uh, broadband at the affordability frontier, like mobile broadband. But some of these wireless technologies are like mobile broadband and they provide voice, SMS, and data. Some of them just provide data. 
So the first one here, uh, GPON, um, it's called passive because these optical networks don't need any power between the head ends uh, and the subscriber units. Now the head ends can be in a building, they can be in a cabinet on the side of the road, or like in this photo below, they can be on a pole. That's how big it is. Uh, and these micro OLTs here can support up to 2000 subscribers. Uh, they can reach up to 40 kilometers in a star topology. Um, most people don't build networks that are that wide, but in very sparse places, um, there's no reason that you wouldn't. Fiber is very cheap. So these small pole mounted network cabinets can provide service to 2000 subscribers. If you're doing this, you're having every 128 users share a 2.4 gigabit per second access medium in the downlink, 1.2 gigabit per second in the uplink. One of the things you can do with mobile networks that um, we see very few places in the world is a concept called RAN sharing or radio access network sharing. Why do we need RAN sharing? Um, GSMA says that you need 3,000 daily users on a tower uh, in a 25 square kilometer uh, um, radius uh, area, I should say, in order to have a profitable service. That's a lot of users in a remote location. Now, tower sharing, which is a big deal here in the Philippines, um, with uh, the Philippine government enabling um, tower codes to, to come in and, and build towers all over the place and lease them to multiple operators, Tower sharing helps. Wholesale roaming agreements help where uh, say I'm on carrier A, um, carrier B provides wholesale roaming in some areas for carrier A. Um, these aren't the most effective ways of um, providing access in remote areas. RAN sharing is absolutely the most efficient. In a case of RAN sharing, uh, like in this photo below, we've got one set of antennas, we've got one set of mobile equipment, we've got one set of radio spectrum, We've got three carriers all offering their own service over this system. You as a consumer will not know that you're on a RAN sharing tower. It's going to look like you have signal from your carrier. You don't know that you're roaming uh, and uh, the service just works. The control happens in the core of each individual mobile network operator. Um, so this is uh, this is an example of a Moran. In the paper, I discuss a couple of different RAN sharing technologies. Now, another thing that happens with um, LTE at the affordability frontier are small cells. These are um, small devices meant for small coverage areas, uh, as in one kilometer dist uh, radius. They take low power. I said before, a cell tower generally takes five kilowatts. You can get small cells that run at 200 watts per sector. Um, you can get them at 100 watts per sector. 200 watts is about normal for a small cell. Um, and um, the trade-off here is that they don't support 3,000 users. They support 128, or they support 64 or 32. They, they support far fewer users, um, but they're good for low-density areas in remote locations. Another LTE technology at the affordability frontier is LTE fixed wireless. Um, this can be from a small cell. It can be from a carrier macro cell network. The idea is that you put a terminal on a rooftop. The terminal has a built-in antenna. The antenna gets you a longer path. You have a cable. It comes to an indoor terminal. The indoor terminal has Wi-Fi. So when you're using LTE fixed wireless access, you are using Wi-Fi on uh, your consumer devices inside connected to a terminal. 30Ks is a typical reach for 4G, but um, 200 is possible and actually done by Telstra in Australia. Um, they were uh, the first to work on this, I think, with Ericsson. Uh, and some of their remote towers are set up for um, ultra long distance communications because if you live where Rhett lives in the middle of nowhere, um, you, uh, you're 40 kilometers drive from the nearest gas station and there's nobody else out there with you. So you really need that long distance. Community LTE. Community LTE takes the idea of small cells, which still provide voice and SMS service um, and are still part of a mobile network. Community LTE gets rid of that. They get rid of um, the, um, the mobile network core, the idea of cell handovers, the idea of roaming, the idea of doing voice. You have a, a, a gateway to the internet inside of your small cell. So you have this device, it's like an LTE Wi-Fi hotspot. You um, put it up, 
um, you issue SIM cards, uh, you have it connected straight to the internet, and um, you basically have cellular hotspots. Now, this is um, something that's going on quite a bit in the US with um, one of their open spectrum bands called CBRS. Um, we are starting to see it here. This example here is in Indonesia. Um, there, there is community LTE equipment out there in the sort of $2,000 range. So um, it's something that is an up and coming technology. So I um, talked about open spectrum um, a couple of minutes ago. Most people use open spectrum daily. Um, it's used for Wi-Fi. It can be used for fixed wireless. Um, Wi-Fi itself, and I make this point, um, Wi-Fi is a last inch technology. It works well when you're close by. 10 meters, 50 meters, you get to 100 meters and Wi-Fi actually stops working well. I mean, even in this room, I, I heard some people complaining that Wi-Fi wasn't working so well. Open spectrum fixed wireless takes, generally takes a Wi-Fi chipset, changes the software, changes the protocols, allows you to use Wi-Fi chipsets and Wi-Fi spectrum outdoors in a point-to-point -point or a point-to-multi-point configuration where you have terminals just like you have LTE fixed wireless. You've got a little tower, you've got a little terminal on a rooftop, you get your distances of tens of kilometers. Here are a couple of examples of this from some of my customers. The one on the left is a microsite. It's providing service to four or five households uh, in a remote valley in uh, Taranaki in New Zealand. And it has an, a fixed wireless, uh, open spectrum fixed wireless backhaul, taking it back to a tower and then to another tower and then to another tower and eventually to fiber optic. On the right hand side, uh, we've got a, a more serious um, tower on a um, hill called Kalrenike in uh, uh, Gisborne, uh, Nelson area. Uh, and uh, this provides service to a few tens of households and actually has around 500 megabits per second, exactly 500 megabits per second of backhaul. You think, wow, how do you do 500 megabits per second of backhaul on little dishes like this? Well, all last mile solutions need backhaul. Microwave, as I said before, is the most common mobile tower backhaul worldwide far more common than fiber still. Open spectrum fixed wireless, like we saw on the left here, um, it's good. It's good, especially where you're in a remote area. There are no other users around. You're the only one using the spectrum. There's no interference potential. Um, microwave is uh, light with licensed spectrum is a much better option because in 30 or 50 Watts, you can get 500 or uh, a gigabit uh, worth of microwave backhaul um, with a very low amount of power. So 30 or 50 watts to power your microwave unit and uh, you get 500 megs or a gig. GPON can be a great option where you've got cable, where you can hang cables. Um, fiber for GPON tails is like 20 cents a meter now. It's $200 a kilometer. That's not a lot of money. That's, that's less than microwave units if you're doing you know, 20, 30 kilometer GPON drop. And finally, LEO satellite networks, LEO satellites like Starlink, which uh, just launched in um, the Philippines last week. Yes, it can be used to uh, backhaul wireless towers, like in this photo on the left from my friend Liam. This is a Starlink dishy terminal that he's got feeding a, uh, a little Wi-Fi repeater for, uh, or this is actually is a Wi-Fi repeater for, for local coverage on a farm. Um, in the recovery to the cyclone in New Zealand, there were tens of Starlink units that were connected to mobile phone towers and connected to wireless ISP sites uh, and brought plugged into generators connected at um, community centers to get people access to the internet. Can be very good, it can be very fast. Uh, on the right, we've got more traditional microwave backhaul. Um, I did the license engineering for all of these uh, links on the Gizmer Net Tower. And some of these are going 50 or 60 kilometers from this tower location. They're still only using 30 or 50 watts per dish. Um, they're all getting at least 500 megabits per second. So um, it is a very good option, especially if you have a structure you can put big dishes on. The um, Starlink terminal, by the way, takes more than 100 watts, uh, up to 150 watts in cold climates where it needs to use its heater. So um, Starlink is not as power efficient as microwave. Starlink is also only giving you around 200 megabits down and 10 or 15 megabits up um, for your 100 watts, whereas these microwave links are giving you 
500 megs or a gig for your 30 or 50 watts. So the microwave is definitely much more power efficient for the amount of capacity you get. So this is just an excerpt from the paper. I don't expect anybody to really look at this. Um, the point is that there are a lot of trade-offs when it comes to um, building access networks. The lowest cost, lowest power, and highest throughput access networks here do not support mobility. And yet, what is it that everybody wants? They all want their cell phones to work everywhere. So you can build really good, really high capacity, really inexpensive connectivity in rural and remote areas, but in general, it's not gonna be a traditional mobile network. So how do we get broadband out there? How do we get it out to the affordability frontier? Well, there are some finance strategies and one of those is by creating service obligations. This is where a regulator may say to an operator, hey, if you want some fancy 5G spectrum, we want you to build a whole bunch of remote towers. We want you to cross subsidize these remote towers with income from your urban networks. Uh, France and Brazil are two great examples of this happening with uh, very recent auctions. Now, a smart subsidy is a one-time subsidy usually provided, usually provided to a carrier um, or an infrastructure provider to help service get established in a remote location, in a location where it's not economic to build. Um, smart subsidies expect that once this infrastructure is built, it will be financially sustainable, um, that it will not need ongoing subsidies to continue operating. And oftentimes a, a government finance provider will make a contract with the recipient of the finance and say, well, you need to have this infrastructure running here for 10 years uh, in order to get the money. I think that when governments um, provide smart subsidies for um, unaffordable um, places that they should be financing only open access infrastructure. Um, for example, towers built by tower co's, operated by tower co's, and towers that are only available on a wholesale basis and not owned by a single operator and can't be excluded. Um, same with fiber optic cables. I, I don't think any government should subsidize a fiber optic cable that goes to a remote province uh, and then give that cable to a single operator. I think any cable like that should be available for everyone. Uh, sometimes governments decide to provide a subsidy for a managed service. A good example would be um, Vanuatu uh, provided connectivity to a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, nursing um, stations, medicine dispensaries um, on different islands, satellite backhaul. And they said, what, along with this, you need to have Wi-Fi access points for the local community to access the internet. So the provider put all of these satellite links in and um, put Wi-Fi public Wi-Fi access points in along with this. Um, the problem you have with these uh, limited subsidies is that once the contract for service ends, um, the local access goes away too, or can. Now, final one, sending party pays. I talk about this more in the paper. I know this is, a, is um, an offensive topic to some people in the internet community. And I wouldn't be surprised if somebody gets up with a microphone and, and makes a comment, even after the no comments earlier today. But um, toll-free calls and free posts are uh, analog examples of sending party pays. It means that um, you as the sender of information are paying for it. Um, I know nobody wants to hear this. In, in New Zealand, um, a couple of government departments have actually paid the mobile carriers to make information free and, and not charging data on your mobile plan. So our Ministry of Social Development and our Ministry of Health um, have made it so that you can have a cell phone subscription with zero credit, a prepaid cell phone, uh, no data left. You can still access their websites. Uh, and that's because they're paying the carriers to carry their data. I think this is a great idea for government data. I think it's a great idea for educational data. I think it's a terrible idea if corporations are allowed to start doing this. But uh, but it can be a very effective uh, thing for promoting access in uh, places where people really don't have the money to, to spend on access. Now, some policies. Uh, this, is, this is the last of the talk here. <laughs> Um, broadband plans I'll just mention because they're an important way for countries to um, 
kind of define their needs and organize a way of uh, meeting the needs of their people. And the people should be the focus in these plans. Public Wi-Fi is very, very popular in this region. Um, the Philippines has People Connect. Um, India has PM Wani. Uh, there have been other projects throughout the region uh, done with Facebook Wi-Fi, Express Wi-Fi, and Google Station um, that have brought public Wi-Fi out. Public Wi-Fi is great, but public Wi-Fi does not generally help women and people with disabilities. It does not generally help people who don't have their own personal devices. In order to have equitable access to the internet, it needs to be available in the home where people can use it in private. Now, um, here we go on, on my rants uh, after building infrastructure here in the Philippines and um, helping with projects in Indonesia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, and of course, in, in New Zealand and Australia, um, national regulations should establish norms for telco infrastructure. In the Philippines, it can take tens of permits to build a mobile tower. Uh, and, um, and that just doesn't work. In New Zealand, you don't need a permit. If your mobile tower is of a certain size in a certain location, you don't actually need a permit to build it because the government passed a law that says these are the national regulations. This is what you're allowed to do without asking special permission. Um, this is a great idea that I would love to see copied throughout the region. Now, if you are going to have permits, um, there is the idea that a permit should be deemed approved if you don't act on it. So um, sometimes you might apply to a government agency for a permit, and then they might not do anything. They might just sit on it. It might sit there for weeks or months, and you can call them and come back in person, and they're just not doing anything. Permits should be applied after 30 days, uh, should be approved automatically after 30 days uh, if they're not acted on. This is a regulation that exists in some countries in this world, so it would not be a unique uh, or new thing. I think that co-deployment should be uh, enabled and promoted. Co-deployment is allowing fiber optic cables to be built along new roadways, along bridges, along new power lines, uh, and um, it should be promoted on a cost-sharing basis uh, because sometimes we see utility operators and governments say, right, you're going to gain a great value by bringing your fiber out to this remote area. We want you to pay a commercial return for putting your fiber there. We want a cut of the revenue. This, this has happened in New Zealand too. Uh, it doesn't anymore, um, but um, it should be uh, charged on a cost-sharing basis uh, and, and in a non-discriminatory basis. Um, finally, radio spectrum management. Radio is my, uh, my specialty here. Um, radio spectrum is important. Um, spectrum should be made available for services that benefit society. Um, in general, this is mobile spectrum open spectrum for Wi-Fi and fixed wireless and satellite spectrum. Um, it should be priced to balance the benefits to the society and revenue, because sometimes countries say, oh, we can get a billion dollars by auctioning this radio spectrum. And then they take the money and they spend the money on programs that have nothing to do with telecommunications. And then they complain that it's expensive for people to buy mobile service. And that's because every dollar a carrier spends on radio spectrum is money they're not spending on infrastructure. So that's my rant there. Um, finally, uh, flexible licensing regimes. I mentioned before that most countries do not allow carriers to build their own infrastructure. Um, they have this idea of uh, facilities-based operators. They have this idea here in the Philippines of a legislative franchise for building uh, infrastructure. Um, this is a terrible idea because these regulations are meant for large companies. They're meant for large national access providers, and they uh, they are a barrier to community networks. They're a barrier to small ISPs, um, local and regional providers that need to be able to build infrastructure to serve small communities. Um, so all countries in this region should be making new legislation enabling small fiber networks and small wireless networks to be built and say, well, maybe once you have a thousand subscribers, then there's a different set of rules that applies to you. But if you're a community network providing 50 or 100 households, then no, you shouldn't have these um, onerous requirements. 
Um, I think that uh, market restrictions for international operators should be eased, especially where these international operators are providing wholesale uh, services, say they're providing open access fiber, open access towers, um, they, they shouldn't be required to um, engage a local partner and, and provide a revenue share to a local partner who may not be doing anything. Uh, and finally, I think that global satellite companies um, should be able to participate in um, all markets on a fair and open basis, um, especially because emerging low earth orbit networks like Starlink and OneWeb and uh, O3B Mpower um, are going to provide global coverage good for access and backhaul. Um, allowing them to sell wholesale capacity without requiring them to set up their own business in every single country. Um, if they only sell wholesale capacity, they're going to be providing a benefit to the market and the people of the country. Um, next slide, please. Ah, there we go. Excellent. So that's it. Um, again, um, same disclaimer as at the beginning. Um, these are my views. They don't necessarily reflect the views and policies of the ADB or its Board of Governors. However, please scan the QR code, download the paper. Paper's around 70 pages. You don't have to read all of it. It's, uh, um, it was a lot of fun working on it, um, a lot of fun working with the people who helped me on this. Uh, I don't know if Raj Singh is in the audience. Um, he was one of the reviewers. Um, Grace Santos, who's been out in the hallway today, is another one of the reviewers. My great friend Steve Song um, from Mozilla Foundation was another reviewer. Uh, we all had a great time uh, doing this paper, and we hope it's useful to you. Thank you. Any questions for John? What have we done to you this afternoon? <laughs> We normally get so many questions for our APOP speakers, and we have had not a single one for Garta, or Mark, or, or John. Nothing? No? Oh, well. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful talk. Appreciate it. Oh, I got a pen. You got a pen. Right. Um, so that brings us to the end of um, today's session. Um, we had three great talks. Um, we reckon these were the best that were offered for the program. So we wanted to share them with you all. Um, tomorrow morning, we start again, 9.30, with the second APOP session. Uh, Maz will be chairing that. Um, so we welcome you back then. So the opening social tonight uh, starts at 7 p.m. It's in the Conrad Hotel. Buses will start leaving at 6.30. Now, to collect the bus or get to the bus, please come to the registration desk and the PHNOG team will guide you where you have to go to catch the bus. The buses will be out in the car park out at the front. They can't come up to the front door. So the PHNOG team will guide you where to collect your bus. So the first bus leaves at 6.30. Um, Prizes are apparently going to be awarded for the best national dress. Um, so folks who want to dress up in local costume or the Filipino costume um, or go as is, it's up to you. Um, prizes are going to be awarded. It's, I don't know, you're going to learn a lot about PHNOG when you're here this week. And um, we don't know what surprises there will be. Um, I'm looking at Achi because I don't know what he's planning. But anyway, I hope you enjoy the social event this evening. It's sponsored by PH Colo. We really, really appreciate that sponsorship and I'm looking forward to a great evening. Enjoy the evening and we will see you back here tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much.